Hi everybody. Uh, I really love this group. I just think that this just feels so much like homebrew. Uh, anyway, let me get started. So my talk is about knowing your behavior type. My story begins when uh, I decided I wanted to run. I was clinically obese at one point in my life and I was never athletic. And so about a year and a half ago, I decided that running seemed like an awesome thing to do uh, because I really admired how some people really enjoy this activity. But my goal wasn't to be a competitive athlete. I just wanted to create a healthy habit for the rest of my life. Uh, so here's the common wisdom I got. Here's what I heard. I heard, no pain, no gain. Never quit. Set goals and get others involved. Well, every single one of those things failed for me. I, I worked in the process and tried each one of these. None of them worked. Here's what did work. I made the activity simple and easy. I focused on the fun. I uh, crafted in my mind what I call a minimum enjoyable action. So I took tiny steps, I'd go out and just walk, and the walk sometimes would turn into a run, but when it wasn't fun anymore, I'd stop and go back to my minimum enjoyable action, my Mia. And then I would trigger and track. Uh, I know we love gadgets that track and trigger. This was my high-tech gadget. It was a piece of paper that I would check whenever I went out and took a walk or a run. Uh, by my nightstand, and that served both as a, as a trigger and a tracking mechanism. So, um, what I learned in that process is what I call the, uh, an amateur behavior, right? It was a, it's a behavior that's pretty easy to do, like flossing your teeth, taking your medication, getting on the scale every day. For me, it was taking a run or a walk. These type of amateur behaviors have a few things in common. They're lifetime goals. They're slow, small changes that we make over a lifetime. Uh, they're rewards-based. We do them for some kind of uh, pleasure-seeking motivation, and most importantly, we're okay with being okay, right? So we're not, I wasn't looking to be a, a, a pro athlete, I just wanted to create a healthy habit in my life. But, you know, what if you're not okay with being okay? Uh, what if you want to be really good at something? So I wanted to start blogging, and I wanted to get serious about blogging, and so I tried to use those same techniques that I found so effective learning to run on being, being a blogger. Uh, and it didn't work at all. Uh, this was, I, I found in myself, a different behavior type, where the methodology I used to change one behavior in my life didn't work at all at changing this behavior. So these skillful behaviors have a lot of things in common. If you think about learning a musical instrument or being great at chess or being a, a great computer engineer, uh, they have several things in common. One of them is the fact that you require baseline competency, right? So before you can play a musical instrument, you have to learn the scale. You have to learn a certain amount of competency. Uh, it's hard work. It requires a lot of big change, and it's very outcome-driven. So um, there's a lot of people who write about how to uh, create skillful behaviors, Malcolm Gladwell and Daniel Coyle. Uh, there's been a lot written about it. And basically, the summary of all these techniques is that you need deliberate practice. You need to focus on your failures. Uh, it's about grit and perseverance, and it's about coaching. Well, what's interesting is that when you compare these two behavior types, the amateur versus the skillful behavior, they're totally different. And where we screw up a lot of times in designing behaviors and designing gadgets to help us quantify our behaviors is that we mix the behavior change methods for the behavior change types. And so you can see, you know, one is about grit and perseverance and hard work, and the other is about pleasure and process and self-motivated direction, okay? So the, part of the difference, the, the common element I found that can describe the two different types of behavior types was the degree of self-control. Skillful behaviors require a high degree of self-control, amateur behaviors require a low degree of self-control. Okay, great, lesson learned. I figured out how to create new behaviors. Um, now I, I run four days a week, and I blog every week for TechCrunch and Forbes. I love it, it's great, but can, could I, how could I use these methods to stop bad behaviors that I didn't want in my life? How could I rid myself of behaviors? Well, for me, it was about resisting unhealthy food. I love carbs, and I have a huge sweet tooth, and so, um, I, I tried to figure out how could I stop some behaviors in my life that I, I wanted to get rid of, and so I, I kind of figured out a new class of behavior, which I call habitual behaviors. So this is, these are behaviors like biting your nails or resisting sweets or an email addiction or maybe a, a shopping habit. Um, the conventional wisdom around stopping a habit like this is, you know, just don't think about it or um, you know, dis distract yourself or punish the behavior. I involve other people to make sure you don't, you don't do it. Well, all these, for me, again, fail miserably. Uh, the, the, because these habitual behaviors have a few things in common. They're about constant temptations, right? We can't stop eating completely. We have to deal with, uh, with food all around us. So we need to learn how to, how to uh, deal with moderation. 
And the most important thing is that habitual behaviors are about dealing with the pain of desire. Kelly McGonigal talks about this in her, in her book, or in her latest book, which is fantastic, about how it's really about dealing with the stress that the stress that the dopamine system creates in our in our brains. It's about dealing with the pain of desire. So um, you know, there's lots that I'm just watching my time. But there's been lots written on dealing with the stress of desire. What worked for me was about managing the pain of desiring uh, the behavior, creating space, creating mindful awareness, and surfing the urge. And so by by doing a number of different things, like bringing awareness to the urge bringing about a 10 minute rule. So I could eat whatever I wanted as long as I just waited 10 minutes before I ate that thing, uh, reminded myself of the purpose, and bringing self-compassion, right? So really allowing myself to fail, knowing that that happens often. Um, with this technique over about 12 months, I lost about 12 pounds, I lost about 20 pounds and increased my lean body mass. Um, and most importantly, I started putting a, 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 a matrix together about the different behavior types. So on the top is things that you want to do, behaviors you want to create. On the bottom is things you want to resist doing, and then low and high self-control. The missing quadrant was addictive behaviors, which we all know as uh, chemical addictions or you know, sometimes behavioral addictions, things that have these characteristics of being self-destructive, binary, right? So you're either clean or you're sober, and they're very hard to resist. Um, around stopping addictive behaviors, again, completely new set of methods to stop addictive behaviors. This is about total abstinence. It's not about moderation like it would be for, for eating better. This is about total abstinence from, from the addictive behavior and root cause analysis. So with that, with that matrix, now when I ask myself, okay, what is the behavior I want to change? I can first identify what the behavior type is and then apply the appropriate method for that behavior. So that's my two takeaways, is identify the behavior and then use the appropriate behavior change method. Okay. And I would love to hear feedback on this presentation, so if you could zap this for me, I love feedback. <laughs> and uh, if you fill out this quick survey, you get these slides and this cheat sheet of uh, how to use these behaviors for behaviors, or behavior methods to change the behaviors you're looking to change at the end of that survey. So please zap that and give me a quick feedback. So let's give a round of applause. He has a great blog again, near and uh, far, and he actually, you can see, he talks about psychology, uh, technology, and business. So, questions for yes. Nir? Yeah. What did you try? Um, so I didn't get, I didn't get into the, 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 the details of it, just because there was a lot to put in, but, um, so some things I didn't track at all. Like, I think for um, uh, stopping certain behaviors, Originally, I, I tracked calories. When I was in that habituate category, when I tried to eat better food, I tracked calories. Didn't work at all. And I think, I, I think it has that opposite effect, the moral licensing effect, as well as the, um, uh, the what the hell effect that, that Kelly talks about again. What, what I found was when I started tracking, uh, if I fell off the wagon for the day, what the hell? <laughs> I would totally stop and the day would be lost. And so I found that I was much better at stopping habitual behaviors when I stopped tracking. As opposed to when I started doing expert behaviors, tracking came in handy, right? When I wanted to, to, to be a better blogger, I started tracking how many words per day I was writing and how I was doing on a weekly basis. And that's where tracking really became effective, was in that expert, uh, skillful behavior quadrant. Yes, ma'am. Um, let me preface this by saying either answer is totally cool, but is, is your takeaway for us that the world is sort of divided into this two by two matrix? Or is your takeaway for us, everybody has a different matrix and figure out your own? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. Uh, I need more data <laughs> because this, so I read a bunch of experts and tried to put each expert into a quadrant. And it seemed like this is what I was distilling from what each expert is. Now, the problem is, and where I got into a lot of trouble, is that each expert says that their solution is the way to fix everything. And that always got me into trouble, right? Because, you know, baby steps are great, but they're not great for stopping addictive behavior. You can't baby step your way out of a cigarette addiction. And I don't think it works. At least, well, I didn't smoke, but I don't, I don't think it works. So um, for me, putting them into these four quadrants and then tackling the, the problem seemed to help a ton. But I would love to hear other people trying and tell me what, what happens. Yeah. Um, so what was the list of behaviors that you 
worked on yourself? Yeah, so I, I've got a, a really long list, but uh, so, so we talked about uh, eating, eating better, so I, I, I'm on a pretty low sugar diet now, whereas before I ate a lot of sugar. I don't drink milk anymore, uh, um, well, in, mo in severe moderation. Uh, I run four times a week, I limit my caffeine intake, um, uh, pretty low carbohydrates, uh, get to bed on time, so I, I now sleep eight hours a day. I turn off internet. Uh, I don't watch TV unless I'm working out. What, what will you track when you say you um, you don't watch internet and you don't watch TV? What um, what were you, what was your goal there? What were you tracking? What, how did that how did those behaviours? Or did you just decide that they were good in their own right? And then you, you, you mean why did I pick those behaviours? Yeah, what are those related? Oh, because they, these were just, these were things that were. These were things that were not helping my life. They were not making me happier. Oh, so how so watching things? TV uh, was not what, when I was mindful about what I, how I felt after I watched TV. I it was a destructive it made you feel bad. behavior in my life. Right. Okay. So there were right. behaviors that made you feel bad. The behaviors that made me feel and bad. And then you found that you had trouble moderating those behaviors. Yeah. So um, and so this is why you, you looked for these methods. That's right. To, That's right. So there was a bunch of. There was a bunch of change I wanted to make in my life, right. um, and so I tried these different techniques to figure out what worked and what did. But driven by knowing, like I'm doing this thing and I don't like the way it feels, mm -hmm. but I'm having trouble controlling it. Is that that? Yeah. For, so for some behaviors, it was starting a new behavior, right? Things I desired to have in my life, and then others were cutting them out of my life. Right. So I think it's amazing that you were able to tackle so many goals. And what was your strategy? Because like, I mean, I find if I want to exercise and eat more, they kind of, I don't know, it's the willpower muscle. Like one suffers, the other does well, and then I throw in all the other goals from every other role in life. And then just either nothing works or one works really well. And I wonder, did you like tackle them sequentially? Did you just say, let's do it? What was your approach to so it? I have to give you a bit of a secret here. Is, uh, I had a lot of time on my hands. <laughs> so I sold uh, my, my company in August of last year. And uh, for about a month, I was like, woohoo, I don't have to go to work anymore. And then I got really bored. <laughs> and I started doing this. So um, I, I, I think I had enough. I had a stress level in my life where I could take on multiple goals at once. And by the way, this is almost a year of doing this stuff now. So it's been a long time. Um, but I also didn't have the daily stress of work. There's no way I could have done this much while having the stress of work because I think that willpower is a muscle that it just can't lift. You know, past a certain point it breaks and it can't lift anymore. Um, so I think that's part of it. So answer your question. <laughs> but if I think I think still this is possible, I just wouldn't do it all at once. I would do like one discrete goal. Um, and to go back to your question, actually, some of the stuff that I used to track, like I used to track how much I, I ran just to put a checkbox, I never do that anymore. Like, never ever. I, I don't care. I just do it because it feels good. So if um, you, often people who sold companies get bored, they start another company. Yeah. Um, if you did that, you'd be bringing back that kind of stress into your life. Or, I mean, presumably because you enjoy it. Yeah. Um, do you think that would kind of interfere with the, the behaviors that you've managed to kind of establish? Do you know what I mean? You're saying that, that your, your freedom from having to, uh, having the stress of work is enabling you to do this. When you go back into work, are you, are you worried that it's going to relapse? So change is stressful, right? Change requires work. Um, and I would only do one change at a time if I, you know, if I had a right. full-time thing. Um, but now I am back at a, at a full-time Thing pretty much. I mean, blogging and the rest of the stuff. So it's taking those hours in the day, um, but the habits remain, right? Because I, that that um, the amateur behavior of running today is a pleasure-seeking behavior. Like, I don't need any incentive to do it. I just love running now. Whereas I hated running before. I hated anything athletic. So that's sticking with me. For but now it's actually become a stress reliever because it's a pleasure-seeking behavior. That's it. Any others?